Good morning and welcome. Thank you for connecting everyone. Let's pray and we'll continue with our study of the book of James. Um, I, or maybe Zeli, Zeli, could you please lead us in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence in Jesus' name. As we begin our class today, Holy Spirit, you help us, each one of us, Lord. Prepare our hearts so that we will receive whatever our pastor has for us this morning, Lord. We thank you, we bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Zeli. Uh, yesterday, we started with an introduction to the book of James. We said that it's possibly one of the earliest books that was written by the Apostle James. And we know that James was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. Initially, he, very similar to his, uh, the rest of the family, did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But later on, uh, especially we, we saw the scripture that said that after his resurrection, he put his trust in the Lord Jesus. And uh, we see how he became the leader of the church. And he he's giving a set of instructions to the church in this book of James. Uh, at the time when James wrote this, the early church was going through challenges, difficulties, uh, especially of the rich Jews overbearing, being overbearing on the Christian Jews and so he is encouraging them he's speaking about you know different different things that will help them and also uh, instructing them regarding the right attitude that they need to maintain uh, regarding various matters so we began with his introduction of himself where he calls himself as a born servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then we said how his life had been transformed and his understanding of the relationship that he had with Jesus had been transformed. He looked at Jesus as the Christ. He calls Jesus the Christ. So uh, that is very beautiful. We went on to seeing that he calls the believers to be joyful. So count it all joy when you fall into various trials. So under uh, different challenges to be strong, joyful, because the result of that is that patience will be developed in us. And when the work of patience is completed, uh, you know, we will be lacking nothing. We also saw a parallel scripture from Romans 5 that teaches us about uh, going through tribulations, in, in a manner that you know we we trust God and we persevere. Perseverance then would lead to character and character to hope. And this is necessary in the life of believers because it's the sign of maturing. It's the sign of uh, becoming those well-able believers. We saw that uh, analogy of the diamond, how under pressure it becomes carbon becomes something so beautiful the same way we as believers also when we go through our difficulties with the right attitude uh, god's character will be uh, formed in us and then we saw how he invites the believers to have ask for wisdom because that is what we need in our time of difficulty we need god's wisdom and we need his solutions so we can seek god for it and we've seen how god gives abundant wisdom when we ask with faith we also saw that when we ask doubting we cannot re really receive from god and there is always that danger of uh, being a person who is double minded and when we are double minded uh, it it makes us unfruitful we've looked at that as well and then later uh, talking about the rich and the poor he uh, said that uh, riches, earthly riches are but temporary, that we must not really count on it. It's there uh, today and it may be gone tomorrow. Uh, and therefore, you know, that should not become what our identity is based on. And uh, another part was regarding temptation. So where he spoke that temptation is not from God. God is not the author of temptation. And God also uh, is, isn't tempted. God cannot be tempted by evil, is what he states. Uh, so where does temptation originate? It originates from the evil one, the enemy. And we also saw, while that is an external influence, we 
through our own fleshly desires can also fall into temptation so it's both external and internal because of our flesh so we have to overcome that and uh, not let a progression happen we saw right like desire then when the desire is conceived meaning we we've come to a place where we really want that evil thing then we step in and try to do those things so then sin is birthed out of that and when sin is full grown we saw that death uh, becomes the consequence uh, and uh, therefore we should not go down that path of desiring what is evil then giving birth to sin and then that sin actually leading to death uh, uh, instead we said that we must depend on god and from god instead of temptation good things come so verse 17 it states that every good and perfect gift is from above so temptation is not from god good things are from god uh, and you know uh he is also the father of lights revealing to us a little bit about his character and how he dwells and he is not a god who will change his mind so we can truly depend on him that is as much as we had seen yesterday now we will continue we can start from verse 18 we've already read that uh, section so i'll just try and explain it to us um so we are told here that uh, um we've been brought forth by the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures so when he's saying we he's referring to that early set of believers and he is letting them know that the new life that they have they were born again by the word we understand that there is a work of the word and the work of the spirit in someone being born again so that's the emphasis now he is letting the believers know we were born again because of the word the word of truth which was preached to them and he calls that set of uh, uh, believers as the first fruits why because obviously they are the early church now after the early church we know many different churches were planted and uh, through Uh, the passage of history lots of believers um, have uh, inhabited the earth and they have lived for god and it's continuing now but it began with who began with those apostles and the believers who were part of the church of jerusalem you know and and that uh, early set or the early congregation so that's why he's terming them as first fruits of his creatures and then he goes on to um talk about the importance of being swift to hear or in other words he is calling the believer to be uh, you know mindful of the instructions of god to be mindful uh, and eager to learn instead of you know just just being very rushed and doing whatever they want in the section that follows he is talking about hearing the word and also doing the word so let me just read it out for us i'm going to read from verse 22 where it says but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself this verse 24 goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work this one will be blessed in what he does so the point he is making here is we said earlier that the theme of faith is part of the book of james so here while faith is necessary and uh, word is important james is telling us that obedience is equally important being a doer of the word that we here so he began by saying be slow to speak but be quick to listen so we the, uh, the point is listen to the word understand the word be obedient to the word so when we are doing hearing the word and doing then there is the balance the right kind of a balance but if that is not the case okay he says something like we are deceiving ourselves 
verse 22, end of that verse, he says, anyone who is just listening to the word and not applying it is doing what? Deceiving, deceiving ourselves. So there can be a false sense of satisfaction by just listening to the word. But then uh, life can be so different or so far away from actually what the word says. And that is a place of deception. And the believers ought to be careful about that. And uh, in, in what he has stated here, we also recognize that when we engage in the word and the word speaks to us and tells us, he, see, he says, right, like when you look into the mirror and you notice something, what do we usually do? You know, if we see a strand of hair that is off, uh, uh, we immediately correct it. And that's similar when it comes to the word. When we engage in the word, the word begins to speak to our hearts. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes to us in areas where we need to change. Uh, and if we don't take action, that again falls in the category of deception. And one should not do that. Be hearers of the word, but be doers also and don't be forgetful hearers is what he is encouraging the believers uh, about now moving on the next section here he's talking about true religion what is um what what is the right kind of religion so there are a few thoughts presented here in verse 26 and 27 firstly he says uh, if anyone thinks that they are religious then one thing that they should be able to do is to bridle their tongue or in other words, control their tongue. If one is not able to manage their speech or have self-control in the words that they speak, he's saying that they have now become, they've gone into deception and uh, their religion is useless. So uh, if we recall, you know, uh, Galatians 5, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. If truly we are walking with the Lord and the Holy Spirit is, is uh, helping us develop His fruit, there will be self-control. So that's the point here. A believer who's, who's growing in the Lord sincerely, there will be a manifestation of this element of self-control in their lives. And uh, what better thing to control? Self-control can be part of many things. But especially the words, especially the words, right? We all understand that uh, it's not easy. Our words can sometimes get us into trouble because we may speak faster than we think. Again, okay, someone once said that uh, the tongue is uh, the smallest muscle, like, uh, you know, voluntary muscle, uh, but it controls life, isn't it? It, it can move and it can control life. And uh, James is going to talk so much more about the tongue. Now, sometimes I wonder why James is talking so much about the tongue, where there are things that were going on in the church where, you know, people were speaking um, unbelief and people were speaking against the word of God, possibly. And uh, he he wanted to instruct them to use their word words righteously and uh, use the words wisely. Okay, so if one cannot do that, if the tongue cannot be controlled, if the words cannot be controlled, he's even saying that their religion is useless. So can you imagine? That's quite a strong statement that he's making. Then apart from that, he is stating two more aspects. He says, this is pure and undefiled religion. What? Two things. He says, visit orphans and widows in their trouble. And that just shows us that having a heart of compassion for those who are in need and widows and orphans come in that category. Like we, we understand in the society, uh, technically there is no one to take care of the, especially the then Jewish society. It was like that. If somebody is a widow or somebody is an orphan, they were helpless. And uh, James is saying, we call ourselves religious, but we don't demonstrate any compassion. How can that be true religion? How can that be true devotion to God? How can that be a devoted life? We have to take care of the helpless and the needy. That's where he brings in. True uh, um, devotion towards God is speaking right words in a self-controlled way. Second, taking care of the helpless. Here, 
he's categorizing orphans and widows in that helpless category. And then he says, keep oneself unspotted from the world. So what is the third one? True religion is to live an overcoming life. Overcome? sin overcome the attacks of the devil we know that the world is is a is a place that will try to attract us and it will try to pull on our desires and uh, it, it will move us towards sinning but then a real devoted believer is one who will keep themselves okay and uh, they will overcome the works of the evil one so 1 john chapter 5 verse 18 talks about this one that we who are truly believing the lord journeying with the lord uh, such a one he keeps himself and the evil one cannot touch him right uh, and, and so these are the the indicators of true religion just give me a moment Yeah, 1 John 5.18, that's the correct reference. So you could look it up if you want to. Yes, so we've understood. So uh, religion, being religious or uh, piety is another word that is used. Uh, being pious, true piety is not assuming piety, but it is demonstrated by our life and actions. So on the basis of what we do, how we speak, you know, how we conduct ourselves, we can affirm that we are pious towards God. And that's what James is calling us to. Now, in uh, the chapter so far, we came across uh, James warning us regarding deception, right? Don't deceive yourselves, don't deceive yourselves. So a little bit about uh, deception. If we quickly go back, we'll look at a couple of scriptures. I'll read it out for us from here. OK. Uh, yeah, verse 16. He says, do not be deceived. My beloved brethren, every good and perfect gift is from above. So here what he's saying is, do not be deceived uh, is like self-deception, right? Self-deception. And he says every good and perfect gift comes from God. Now, he was speaking about this in the context of temptation. And he said that temptation doesn't come from God. So what is self-deception? Self-deception can be... Um, you know, us blaming God or blaming others for the challenges that we are going through. Okay, so that's one category of being self-deceived, where actually the problem may lie with us, but then we are attributing it to someone else because we cannot bear the thought of taking on responsibility. So don't be self-deceived. So one form of self-deception is where for the problems that we are responsible for, we state that either God is responsible or people around us are responsible. So that is self-deception. Now let's look at verse um, 22 here, where again he says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So another manner of deception that a believer could fall into is uh, by feeling satisfied with one part uh, or feeling satisfied by just engaging in the word. You know, for example, uh, we could do lots and lots of Bible studies. We can have a lot of Bible knowledge, uh, we, we, which is awesome, which is wonderful. And it, we are supposed to. We are supposed to be, uh, you know, very consciously engaging in these things. But as James stated, be doers of the word, not hearers only. So this first part of hearing the word must lead to the second part of doing the word. Now, if a believer is not doing the word, then he says deception, second self-deception, where we are convincing ourselves that because we are hearing the word so much uh, that, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm good. Uh, I'm already pious. I'm already... Um, having this walk with the Lord, but then obedience to the word is lacking. 
right? That's quite problematic, where one has convinced themselves that uh, my walk with the Lord is right. Uh, yes, Lyndon. Uh, Lyndon, did you have a question? I I can see your hand raised. Okay, uh, not able to hear. There's a question you could uh, please unmute. All right, not sure if Lyndon can hear us. I'll keep moving on. And if there's anything, please do stop me. Let's continue. So that's the second form of self-deception, isn't it? where uh, we are saying that uh, we are satisfied only by listening to the word. Now the third one. Third one, let's look at verse 26 here, where uh, scripture says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So deception uh, can also be like, you know, uh, thinking that one is spiritual, but actually lacking the ability to um, self-govern, okay, self-govern or, or manage oneself. And which obviously involves, as James said, taming the tongue. So it involves that. Uh, and also the whole body by engaging in things which are pleasing to God and resisting the things which are not pleasing to God. So these are all forms of self-deception where one can go into a place of thinking more highly of themselves as compared to the reality of what is going on. And uh, we know self-deception is very dangerous because, uh, tell me, give me one example of someone who was uh, self-deceived or who is self-deceived. Huh? Pharisees, OK. Uh, Jeffina is saying Pharisees. Anyone else that you can think of? Deception. How about Satan? You know, I, I, I will become like this and I will go uh, higher than God. Uh, I will be seated on the throne. Deception. The reality is far from what they are believing. And that is why it's so very dangerous. We're done with chapter one. We could now move on to chapter two. So let's go ahead and read the entire chapter. And uh, I'll go ahead and explain it section by section. Uh, let, let's do one thing. Let's read half, maybe, because. I don't know if we'll have the time to complete. Just give me a moment. I'll tell you to tell where to read. Till verse 13. We can read till 13. Verse 1 to 13. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with partiality for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man you stand there or sit here at my foot still have you not shown partiality among among yourself and become judges with evil thoughts. Listen, my bro beloved brethren, has God not shown, has not has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which has which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Don't don't the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Don't they, do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? 
if you really fulfill the royal law accordingly to the scripture, you should love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convinced, convicted by the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole, the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lubega. Uh, okay, there are hands raised, so let's pick up with the questions. Yeah, I just want to ask before we jump into the next chapter. I think in James chapter 1 at last, it says about the law of liberty. I'm trying to understand it in the context of the Old, Old Testament law. Even though why it's known as law, liberty would, would still be a question. And we see it again in chapter two when as well. Like it's always already in chapter one, as well as we see it repeating. Thank you, Jeffina, for that question. So the law of liberty, um, our understanding would be the grace of God, the grace of Jesus. That's the law of liberty because that is what has set us free, isn't it? In the new covenant, that's what has happened. Whereas we have a, a comparable law of Moses, which we cannot term as the law of liberty because it brought in instructions that people could not keep but now we have instructions that we are empowered to keep so that is the law of liberty it's the grace that has come through our lord jesus christ so yeah if we say it's it's the grace uh the law of liberty in and james chapter 2 uh Verse 12, let's say, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of uh, liberty. So it's it just says that we are judged by grace. Should I should I term it in that way? Should I understand it that way? Like yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. So, so judged by the law of liberty means whether you have completely come, accepted that salvation or not. And if you're living out that life of salvation or not. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, did anyone else have something to ask? All right, let's 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 move on then. We'll start with the chapter two. As I stated, uh, the theme is changing. We spoke about do the word. And uh, now we've we've come to the place where we're talking about preferential treatment between or um, uh, among the congregation who are both rich and poor. So James is clearly telling us that there should be no such preferential treatment or in other words, partiality. So in verse one, Chapter 2, he says, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. 
So partiality should not be a part of our ministry. The example that he gives here is that of a rich person walking into our uh, gathering. Excuse me. And how do we know they are rich? Because he's describing a man with gold rings, fine apparel, and they should Obviously, it's somebody who's rich who can afford that kind of dressing. And in those days, you know, maybe that's how they dress. And they came into the, the uh, gathering. And he's also describing a poor man. And how would a poor man dress? Filthy clothes. So when people come in like this, uh, he says, you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes or the rich person. And you give him a good place to sit. Whereas the poor person, we treat them badly and over here he's saying you make them stand uh, or you know you make them uh, sit at my footstool or give them a, a like a, a bad place to sit at because we don't care where they they sit but is that a godly thing to do when we do things like that he's asking us the question have you not shown partiality okay and that is not acceptable by God. So this is a question that we have to ask ourselves. Um, uh, maybe in the time that James was ministering, there was there were these demarcations in the society uh, where part of the same believing community, you had rich people and poor people. And as leaders of that congregation, when the poor are treated badly and the rich are given uh, more honor, it does not bring glory to the name of our God. And James is trying to correct that. Uh, so now think about this. Is it wrong to give honor to some people? You know, maybe a rich person comes in and they are uh, truly someone who has served the Lord. And they have those credentials for us to honor them. That's not what we are talking about. Uh, and also, uh, let's let's understand there's a difference between partiality and honor. So honoring is fine. We can honor God's people, godly people. Uh, but partiality is different, where we are treating one set of people in a special way as compared to another set of people. So partiality is not acceptable favoritism is unfair especially when it comes to the church setting when it comes to the gathering of god's people and we need to be careful about that uh, and then you know uh, along the same lines uh, he he further explains the matter he says when you treat the poor person badly uh, you've dishonored that poor person. And then he's just helping the people understand that, you know, haven't there been incidents where even if somebody is rich, they have been unrighteous. So he says something like in verse 6, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. So he's just explaining some incidents that have taken place. Now, does this mean that when somebody is rich, they are always evil or they do bad things. No, we wouldn't interpret it like that. He's just trying to make us understand that, you know, um, we, we must not exercise prejudice. That's all. Obviously, we know anyone who is born again, whether we are rich or whether we are poor, we're all partakers of the divine call of God. We have the same inheritance. Uh, and having or not having earthly resources doesn't give us any particular standing in the kingdom of god and so we have to settle that in our minds over here he's just trying to make a point and say in this context when there is partiality don't you think we are being unfair haven't you heard of incidents where even if people are rich they have oppressed the poor people uh, and you know so just be careful don't practice partiality and he says in verse 8 if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture what is the royal law he's stating that royal law here you shall love your neighbor as yourself you do well so we know uh, the, the laws that moses gave but among those laws the lord jesus highlighted a couple and he said 
look, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then he followed that up by saying, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And here James is calling those special laws as the royal law. Uh, and he says, we must not show partiality. And verse 9 is very strong, actually. Uh, it's as if it begins like a suggestion where he's saying, don't do this. It's not good. And you must consider the poor. But in verse 9, he categorically states that if one shows partiality, you commit sin. So partiality is not a hey, I prefer this, this set of people over that set of people. It's my preference. It's not a preference any longer. Partiality is now being classified as what? Sin. If you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So quite strongly, he's, he's rebuking. He is uh, clarifying to the people. And he's stating that partiality is not good and don't practice partiality. We move on to the next set of scriptures there where he's talking about keeping the whole law. Okay, uh, And we understand here that when the law of Moses was given, right? what did God want? Did God want man to keep a couple of them and leave the rest out? No. God wanted man to keep all the laws that were given, right? So, but we know that under the uh, law of Moses, the old covenant, we did not have the empowering Holy Spirit. Uh, we know that in the new covenant, the word of God is written in our hearts. So that empowerment was lacking. The law was there, but the empowerment was lacking. Uh, and uh, he's kind of referring to that. And uh, earlier, let's say somebody kept all the nine laws and they missed one. Even if you miss one, you become a transgressor. But now we are part of the law of, or we are part of grace. Okay, So that is the law of liberty. And uh, verse 13, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. He's making a point about the grace that we have received now. Though the law is, um, how do I say, the validity of the law, right? It was there when, when Moses brought it out. One has to keep the law. But now we have something greater, something better, where he's talking about mercy triumphs over judgment. That's what Jesus did for us, isn't it? He brought us God's mercy. And uh, uh, that's what we live with now all right so if there are any questions please feel free to ask we can move to the next section otherwise all right so then let's uh, move on we can read just one section, and well, maybe I'll just stop with that today. This is from verse 14 to verse 19. Yeah, could, could someone read it, please? Verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Does also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead? Should I continue, ma'am? Till which was uh, yes, yes, Rosalind. Till nineteen. But somehow, yes, but someone will faith. say, "You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works." You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, so again, he's coming back to the subject of faith here. And he lets us know that faith and the expression of faith through genuine good works is connected. They're not separate. So he's asking two questions, quite startling questions. Um, uh, you know, he says, uh, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? So can you imagine a person like that? Only faith, no works. That's quite difficult for us to even think about. Because when we are saying there is faith, there's got to be corresponding works. And uh, he asks another question. He says, can faith save him? Right? Uh, while there are no works at all. Can one keep saying that, yeah, it's only on the on the basis of what I'm believing, but I won't have any um, associated works with it. Can that alone save him? So he asks, starts with these two questions, right? But ultimately, the essence of what we just read here is when we say we have faith, we need to have uh, works that come out as an expression of that genuine faith so he's giving an example of helping someone who is in need it would be really sad to see that one can address a problem and we are seeing that people are in difficulty or they are in need but then we are not doing anything about it isn't it so that way if we are saying okay i'm just going to pray and i will not do what i have the power to do in that situation that is not real faith right and we're not showing it by the good works that we can do so he comes in with a strong statement verse 17 he says look also faith by itself if it does not have works is dead very strong he says we cannot keep saying that we have faith and have no works associated with it that kind of faith is even dead or it doesn't count such faith doesn't count uh, so ultimately we need to have faith and also works and he gives the example of demons and he says even demons believe so that there is a god so isn't that faith because they are believing but what about the works that they do they don't do any good works or they don't engage in living out that faith isn't it so then what's the difference? Even the demons believe that there is a God. So it's a strong reminder for us to have a life of faith with the genuine expression of that faith through good works. So whatever we say we have faith for, there's got to be uh, good works associated with that. So with that, we'll just stop for today and we can pick up from where we stopped in the next class. So if there's anything to discuss, we can do that. If not, we can pray and close. All right, so let's pray then. Uh, and would one of you unmute and pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the class that we have. And God, I thank you for your grace upon us, Jesus. We thank you for the work of the cross today. And God, I pray that Jesus will be doer of the words, God. And God, every single thing that we learn today, we will practice it in our life, Jesus. Because uh, there's nothing if we, if we just hear the word but not do it. But so, God, you develop us, equip us in that way. Um, help us to be uh, people who ponder on your words day and night. Just look at you and just stand in awe of you and just uh, please you. Be obedient to you, Jesus. Not just have faith, but also to obey your voice, to be sensitive to, your, uh, to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Build us in such a way, Jesus, so that we can... 
uh, be a blessing. We can be the salt and the light, uh, things that transforms this world, uh, things that uh, people who bring people to your kingdom equip us in such a way, Jesus. I thank you for Pastor Nancy. I thank you for everyone in my class. In Jesus' name I pray. Mm -hmm. Amen. And thank you. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. Um, God bless you and have a great week ahead.